Okay, well, here we are again, Ash 2023, beautiful city of San Diego. Lots of data, lots of abstracts. I'm here with Dr. Jennifer Wyack, who's going to introduce herself in a little bit. And, and Jennifer, we're going to talk a little bit about novel therapies in CLL. It's the world you, you live and you've been living in for a while. But first of all, just tell us about you and, and what you do day in and day out when you're not counting steps at Ash. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my name is Jennifer Wyack. I'm a professor in the Division of Hematology at The Ohio State University. I lead the CLL group and I co-lead the Leukemia Research Program. The Ohio State. We have to, like, I, I was told by my friends I have to, like, the, the yes. has to be out there. <laughs> that is an important part it's of the very title. Important. So, uh, look, I mean, so much data, so many abstracts, a lot of things happen at ASH, and uh, it's impossible to cover everything, but uh, you, had, uh, you had a busy ASH. You had uh, couple of oral presentations in CLL uh, focusing on some new drugs and novel therapies. Um, so tell us about those. We'll start with, you decide which one you want to start with. Well, I guess it's probably most appropriate to start with pirtobrutinib, which is, of course, a highly selective oral non-covalent inhibitor of BTK. And here at ASH, we were able to see the 30-month follow-up data from the Phase 1-2 Bruin trial, which was a large clinical trial that ultimately has led to accelerated approval of pirtobrutinib in both mantle cell previously and now in CLL for patients who had received both a prior covalent BTK inhibitor and a prior BCL2 inhibitor. So in this follow-up, we looked at the cohort of about 280 patients who had previously been treated with a covalent BTK inhibitor and kind of broke that group down further into those who had received a prior BCL2 inhibitor or those that had not. And looking at kind of the whole group of patients, of course, this is a, a high-risk group of patients, multiple prior therapies. The BCL2 exposed group, as you would expect, has more prior lines of treatment and a little bit more high-risk disease, including patients who had had allogeneic stem cell transplants and CAR-T as part of their therapy. Um, when we look at response rates overall, total response rate is over 80%, and it really does not vary among subgroups. Um, we see that very few baseline characteristics seem to affect the response rate to pirtobrutinib being dual refractory, so uh, patient's disease that has come back after BTK and BCL2 inhibitor did not affect response rate. Presence of PLC gamma 2 mutations does appear to trend toward lower response rate as might be expected. And actually the presence of high risk features really didn't seem to make a difference either, so like TP53 mutations, etc. When looking at progression-free survival in the whole cohort, median PFS is 19.4 months. And this does vary a little bit depending on prior BCL2 status. So those patients who had received a prior BCL2 had a little bit shorter progression-free survival at a little bit over 16 months. Those that had not, though, had a median PFS of 23 months. So kind of emphasizing that prior lines of therapy probably does matter. Probably not the Netoclax just itself, but I think just having that more heavily pretreated population. You know, I mean, it's interesting because this is a patient population that they're really unmet medical mm -hmm. need. I mean, I don't want to overuse the word unmet medical need. Uh -huh. I think sometimes it gets over overused, but this is, this is indeed many patients are going to receive these therapies. Mm -hmm. Um, I preface that because I want to ask you how many of this cohort received the second generation BTK like the Zanu and uh, Akala mm -hmm. versus Ibrutinib because I think my sense of what's happening in CLL, the majority of patients with time are really not going to get ibrutinib. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the second generation. Yeah, that's a really good point. So just by virtue of when this study was performed, the majority of patients did receive ibrutinib as their first therapy. I think 40 of them had received acalabrutinib and less than 10 had received xanabrutinib again just because of timing. Yeah. Do you think... Uh, your sense is that you would get the same response, PFS, OS, if they were receiving Xanu or Acala? You yeah, I mean, tell, it's obviously. hard to say with such small patient <laughs> yeah. numbers. I think, you know, maybe Acala Brutinib would be a little bit yeah. uh, more easy to look at, but those analyses haven't yeah. really been completed. Safety-wise, what did you see? Anything? Yeah, so with the prolonged follow-up, safety still looks phenomenal with this agent. So most toxicities are grades 1 and 2. Um, we see, I think, neutropenia is one of the only grade 3 toxicities that's seen as a fair, at a fairly high rate, um, which is, of course, common in CLL patients in general. And then infections are kind of along the lines of what you would expect. Um, when looking at the adverse events of special interest with BTK inhibitors, we still see low rates of atrial fibrillation. I think it's about 4% at this time, low rates of high-grade hypertension. And uh, bruising is relatively uncommon, almost all grade one and two. 
So why are we not using this front line? It seems like uh, no, like less adverse effect. Mm -hmm. Is it being studied in front line? Or? So there are studies that are investigating it in the front line setting. Yeah. I think the biggest uh, hesitation that many of us have to you know moving that to the front line is the resistance mutation. Right. So we also saw an abstract by Jennifer Brown looking at resistance mutations on pirtobrutinib, which mostly involve either the gatekeeper residue in BTK, so T474, or these so-called kinase dead mutations, L528W being the most common one. And the concern is that these mutations likely will make a patient not able to respond well to a covalent BTK inhibitor. Of course, you know, that's all theoretic and based upon laboratory data. Um, but I think, you know, unless we have some strong clinical evidence that you can sequence them in either direction, it seems like the most, at least scientifically, a rational way to do it is a covalent and then a non-covalent. Great. So, but, but there are studies looking at mm -hmm. uh, doing this, so yep. we look forward to this. What's your other uh, uh, presentation that you did? Yeah, so the other abstract is actually looking at a very novel BTK inhibitor called LP168. And this is actually a dual covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitor. It's very selective. Um, and you know, we are presenting at this meeting both preclinical work and the initial clinical trial. And one of the really neat things about this drug, so like I said, it has a dual mechanism of action. So if BTK is wild type, the drug can bind covalently to C41 on BTK, just like ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib bind. However, it also has the ability to kind of fit in that um, ATP binding pocket. And if C41 is mutated, it can bind reversibly. And importantly, it actually binds away from the T474 site, suggesting with the laboratory data that it's going to be effective even in the presence of those T474 mutations that we see with pirtobrutinib. So uh, this study, again, this is the phase one trial, relatively early follow-up, but there were 45 patients treated in total, 37 of them were CLL patients, very high rate of high risk features. Um, a number were dual refractory to BTK and BCL2 inhibitors, and actually a handful had also received a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, safety looks really good, as you would expect from such a, a selective BTK inhibitor. At this time, with about uh, 14 months or 14 cycles of follow-ups, about a year, um, we don't see any atrial fibrillation yet. Of course, that has happened with other BTK inhibitors, and you see it later on, but um, rates of hypertension are really low as well. When looking at response rate, so we do see that um, responses tend to be better when patients received 200 milligrams a day or higher, and the study went up to 300 milligrams a day. But in that cohort of patients, overall response rate was over 70% and did not um, depend on their patient subgroup. So whether they had received a prior non-covalent BTK inhibitor, whether they were dual refractory, um, or even any of the higher the features. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, so that looked about the same. Um, again, relatively short follow-up. But there have been very few patients that have discontinued for disease progression, and a number of people are now out to about two years. Um, so I think, you know, a really exciting molecule that I'm interested to kind of see move forward. And um, there were uh, five patients, I think, with T474 mutation, so that gatekeeper mutation, and the response rate there is also over 70%. Is it moving into phase two? Yeah, so that is, that's the plan. I mean, currently we just have this phase one study, but I think the company is uh, thinking about their strategy for future development. My last question, I'll let you go, I promise, but mm -hmm. it's hard not to ask because we're getting all of these drugs and, you know, I mean, again, huge progress in CLL, but there were always going to be this cohort that is not responding. Mm -hmm. What's your just futuristic view? Is there is there a role for CAR-T in CLL? Um, yeah, you know, I think that there is. I think the problem that we still have is we don't do a very good job of predicting beforehand who is going to respond or not. Yeah. So the responders do fantastic. We saw from the lysosol data, um, while the median PFS is only about 18 months, people with a partial response had a 27-month median PFS and not reached for patients with a complete response. So I think the you know, kind of key things there are going to be to try to do a better job of predicting who's going to have those, especially the complete responses, um, and also really investigating it in earlier lines of therapy for high-risk patients. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Um, Dr. Jennifer Wyack with us with the Hemine Pulse Blood Cancer today, coming to you from ASH 2023. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me.